Good evening and welcome to part two of the 30th annual Family Law Update, presented by the Three Amigos, Commissioner Keith M. Clemens, Commissioner James D. Enman, and Judge Robert A. Schneider. I am Ron Reichstein of Youngman Reichstein PLC, and along with Carrie Holmes of the Harriet Buhai Center for Family Law, we are the co-chairs of the Family Law Section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. We want to take a moment on behalf of the Family Law Section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, its members, and the family law community at large to thank Commissioner Clemens, Commissioner Enman, and Judge Schneider for their three decades of hard work in preparing this presentation and its materials every year. Not many programs like this survive 30 years, mostly because of the tremendous responsibility presenters take on in presenting and coordinating every year. Yet for the past three decades, these gentlemen have done so with incredible grace and seeming effortlessness. Their hard work contributes significantly to the continuing excellence of the Family Law Bar in Los Angeles, and we are so grateful to them. Unfortunately, because we are remote, we couldn't do an actual award presentation, but the Family Law section this week sent each amigo a plaque and a crystal gavel honoring their 30 years of service to our community. We hope our amigos don't think this is an opportunity to ride into the sunset. They are expected back for the next 30 years. We wanna take a moment uh, before we talk about our sponsors uh, to remind everyone about our annual Family Law Meet the Judges Night, which will be held virtually on February 17th at 6 p.m., the very cool optional mixology session at 5.30. Both cocktails and mocktails are available. Please sign up early so that your drink packages will arrive on time. The Family Law section and all of its programs is sponsored by Soberlink. And we have with us today Soberlink's Vice President of Business Development in Family Law, Chris Beck. Ron, thanks for the introduction. You know, Soberlink is a remote, real time alcohol monitoring solution. We have two different programs that we offer. We offer a level one parenting time only. This is where the monitor client would test before pickup every four hours during parenting time and then immediately following um, that drop off. Level two, is our second program, which is daily monitoring, which consists of uh, testing two to three times a day. You know, our device consists of a breathalyzer. We combine it with a camera and we use facial recognition software to confirm identity. And then our modem transmits the information remotely in real time. So you can test from anywhere at any time. And uh, I just wanna say thanks again for allowing us to sponsor this great program. Thanks, Chris. And our other sponsors this evening are White Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna and Hunt, LLP. Our Family Wizard. Event sponsors for the 30th annual Three Amigos annual family law update are Signature Resolution, Gersey Schneider, LLP, Ron J. Onfuso, CPA, Feinberg, Mindel, Brandt, and Klein, LLP, Californian Estates, and ARC, Alternative Resolution Centers. Attendees should have received a link to the materials in the one hour reminder email, and the BHBA will also post a link to the materials in the chat. MCLE certificates will follow by email in about 24 hours. And without further ado, we'll pass it off to the amigos.
guess that I'm going to go first. Uh, the case that I'm going to discuss first is In Re JW, which is at page 36 of your materials. Uh, Mom had a one-year-old child whom we'll call child because the court doesn't tell us what the child's name is, and whose father is called father. In 2016, Mom threatened to kill herself and the child. The police took Mom to a psychiatric facility where she was uh, detained under uh, Welfare and Institutions Code Section 5150. The San Bernardino County uh, Children and Family Services petitioned the juvenile court to make the child and an older half-sister dependents of the juvenile court. Um, CFS's investigation showed that mom had been living with father in Louisiana until mom had come to California just a few weeks earlier. Nevertheless, CFS did not address whether there was jurisdiction here under the UCCJEA, and the juvenile court made no finding concerning the UCCJEA. Indeed, the juvenile court never addressed the UCCJEA jurisdiction in any subsequent hearing, not even when father appeared in the dependency case. Family reunification services were terminated at the 18th month review hearing, and parental rights were terminated in November of 2019. Father appealed, raising for the first time on appeal that the juvenile court lacked jurisdiction under the UCC JEA, and therefore, all of its find, uh, findings and orders must be reversed. The Court of Appeal declined to address this contention on the merits. The court instead held that even assuming the juvenile court lacked UCC JEA jurisdiction, father forfeited his, the ability to raise this argument on appeal because he never raised it in the trial court. Uh, the UCCJEA rules are mandatory, said the Court of Appeal, but it does not regulate the California trial court's fundamental jurisdiction over child custody. The court held that there is a difference between the court's fundamental jurisdiction and the mandatory jurisdictional rules that the court must apply. A party's failure to comply with a mandatory requirement does not necessarily mean that a court loses fundamental jurisdiction resulting in an entire absence of power to hear or determine the case, an absence of authority over the subject matter of the parties. The court held that the legislature in adopting the UCC JEA did not intend to make it a fundamental basis for exercising jurisdiction over child custody. And therefore, father forfeited any claim that California did not have jurisdiction in this case. The judgment of the trial court was affirmed. Bob? Uh, in remarriage of uh, Grimes and Mew is at page 38 of your material. In, this, not, in a not untypical fashion, this case was tried piecemeal. In May of 2018, the trial court found that certain funds in a brokerage account constituted a loan to the community rather than belonging to wife's family members with wife investing in it for them. Wife appealed immediately that ruling and the ruling was ultimately incorporated into the later judgment on all issues. Court of Appeal that finds that under the one judgment rule, the May order was not an appealable order and didn't qualify under the collateral order doctrine as an exception to the rule. And I'm not going to go into that collateral order doctrine um, because, uh, but, but write this case down in case you run into that issue. And that's because the Court of Appeal exercises its authority to hear the issue anyway, in part because there's no prejudice to husband. But wife's appeal fails under the substantial evidence rule. The court had some evidence of the parties paying the taxes on the income from the account, and the trial court didn't find wife's contrary testimony credible. I would have depubbed this part of the opinion, but much more interesting is the balance of the court's ruling on the spousal support issue. Husband, age 43, was a manager at Google slash YouTube, and over the last five years, including the year of separation, his income went from $316,000 per year to $70,000. $778,000 per year. 
wife, age 49, had income that never went above 133,000 as a treasury analyst. She lost one post-separation job, didn't work for about two years and was earning about $96,000 a year at the time of trial. This was an 11 and a half year marriage. And in the about three years between separation and trial, husband estimated that he paid voluntary support of $250,000 to $300,000. So maybe seven to $8,000 a month. The trial court found the community enjoyed an upper middle class standard of living, that husband could maintain that standard, and that while wife was self-supporting, she could not maintain and retire with that standard. The trial court ordered additional spousal support for one and a half years at $3,000 per month plus 20% on earnings above $300,000. And then after that, $2,000 a month for two years with no Osler Smith, and then $1 a year for another five years. So uh, including the voluntary payments, something like six years of real dollar support, four good years, two lean years, and then five more years of jurisdiction only. Wife naturally appeals. She says, first of all, this measly $2,000 is way below the marital standard. The whole thing is uh, far too short a time. And the court never specified what amount of support it would take to meet the marital standard of living and whether this payment would meet it. Court of Appeal affirms the trial court. Now, again, this is a substantial evidence test, but the Court of Appeal makes some important points. Wife complains she won't meet, meet the marital standard. Court of Appeal says, so what's your point? The court is not required to award support that meets the marital standard. Marital standard, it's not a floor or a ceiling, it's just a reference point along with the other 4320 factors to assist the court in reaching the actual standard which is a just and reasonable result. Other cases have rejected the contention that if the high earner spouse has the ability to maintain the marital standard and pay sufficient support for the payee spouse to do so also, then he must do so. That's not the rule. And that's why the court is not required to specify the income that wife would need to maintain that standard. The case is a good summary of the authorities that support a, let's say, ungenerous support order. And here's another precedent for termination after a lengthy marriage. Jim? Okay, our, our next case is Buckley versus Katina. This is an unpublished case. Do not cite it unless, of course, you have a deep pocket to cover the sanctions and don't care about your license to practice law. But the principle espoused in it is still very important. Buckley sued Katina, who's a singer, whom he alleges in the lawsuit wrongfully fired him to avoid sharing her earnings. Buckley is an attorney. He knew Katina had a new attorney and in fact had been in contact with that attorney. Yet he never advised the new attorney of the lawsuit or when he took uh, Katina's default. In this opinion, it is noted the trial court called it, quote, blatantly unethical not to have let the attorney know of the lawsuit. The appellate court stated Buckley knew that attorney Mark Levinson represented Katina in their, in their dispute. At a minimum, Buckley as an attorney had an ethical responsibility to notify Levinson. The point here is twofold. If you are aware of an attorney uh, who's taking your place or on the other side of the case, let them know you'll be taking a default. Secondly, your reputation for ethical behavior can follow you throughout your career. Keith? Uh, the next case is In Re Marriage of Deal at page 43. Uh, every few years, we get a family law vexatious litigant case. 
Uh, Patricia and Thomas Steele were granted a status-only judgment of dissolution of marriage in 2002 and a judgment on reserved issues in 2008. Thomas was the respondent in the Disso case, but Thomas's conduct in the Disso case and in two civil cases resulted in him being declared a vexatious litigant in 2005. Thomas was ordered to obtain permission from the presiding judge of the court where he was uh, where when he was ever in, in pro per, if he intended to file any new litigation or motion, he needed permission. Thomas appealed, but the vexatious litigant order against Thomas was affirmed by the Court of Appeal in 2006. Well, a year after the court commissioner filed its 2005 order declaring Thomas to be a vexatious litigant, Thomas filed a series of motions to disqualify that commission. When the commissioner failed to respond timely to one of those motions in 2006, the commissioner was thereby automatically disqualified from continuing as the judge in the deal case. However, in 2007, that same commissioner issued his previously issued 2005 vexatious litigant order, this time on the mandatory MC700 Judicial Council form. The reason for doing that was precisely that a vexatious litigant order has to be filed on that MC700 uh, form in addition to the written order that had been filed. Eleven years later, Thomas never gives up. In 2018, Thomas complains to, to the presiding judge about the commissioner having issued orders after his disqualification. The uh, presiding judge issued an OSC with respect to the following issues. One, whether the court should vacate the 2005 vexatious litigant order. Two, whether the court should vacate the 2007 uh, Judicial Council Form MC700 vexatious litigant order. And three, whether it should issue a new vexatious litigant order. After a hearing, the trial court in 2018 issued two orders one finding that Thomas was a vexatious litigant, he never uh, stopped, and second, another pre-filing order requiring Thomas to get the presiding judge's permission before filing any new litigation or motion while in pro per. Thomas appeals again, but the Court of Appeal affirms. First, the court held that a vexatious litigant order to get permission from filing new matters or motions did not apply to Thomas's appeal. Since Thomas had not initiated the OSC that resulted in the orders being appealed, the court, uh, the order requiring Thomas to get pre-filing permission doesn't apply to his ability to appeal the court's orders. Second, the court held that it doesn't matter if you're a petitioner, plaintiff, respondent, or defendant, the vexatious litigant statute can apply to you. That statute's intended to curb abuse of the judicial system, no matter by whom. Third, the Court of Appeal rejected Thomas's claim that the 2005 and 2007 orders were void and held they weren't void. The court then held that whether or not they were void didn't matter because the 2018 orders being appealed made Thomas a vexatious litigant anyhow. The trial court was presumed to have done what was required to make its 2018 order, which included finding that Thomas was a vexatious litigant. The record showed nothing to show that the trial court failed to consider whether to issue the uh, orders that it did. Jim? The next case is by Ramagalu versus National Mortgage, and it involves a discovery issue that we in family law often encounter. Nation Star serves special wrongs requesting all facts supporting the plaintiff's cause of action. The response said, the facts could be found in the many documents that plaintiff then identified. The trial court found the answers to be factually devoid as they listed only documents without stating any facts. So here we turn to CCP 2030.230, which provides, quote, if the answer to an interrogatory to whom the interrogatory is directed and if the burden and expense of preparing and making it would be substantially the same for the party propounding the interrogatory as for the responding party, 
It is a sufficient answer to that interrogatory to refer to this section and to specify the writings which the answer may be derived or ascertained. Thus here, the documents contained facts. They were not devoid of all facts. We cannot tell from this case whether the responding party improperly exercised the option to produce documents under 2030.230. I know it's easier to just give the other side the documents and let them figure out what the case is all about. But maybe, just maybe, spelling out how good a case you have, maybe, just maybe, it might induce them to settle. Back to Keith. The uh, last case involved a vexatious litigant. This case involves, you could say a vexatious attorney, but jerk attorney would probably be more accurate. Um, Bryna and Jeffrey stipulated disso judgment. Oh, I should give you the name of the case. It's Moore versus Superior Court, parentheses, Barsky, at page 46. So Bryna and Jeffrey stipulated disso judgment required Jeffrey to pay child support to Bryna, and Jeffrey didn't pay the support. In 2017, Bryna filed a petition in a probate court seeking to secure payment from the family trust of which Jeffrey was a beneficiary. Uh, the arrearages at that point were about $82,000. The trustee, represented by attorney Moore, responded that the trustee was not authorized to make distributions to Jeffrey while the primary beneficiary, Jeffrey's mother, was still alive. The probate court ordered a mandatory settlement conference and directed the parties to submit the settlement conference statements. So Bryna, represented by an attorney named Parnell, did file the required statement, but uh, Moore and his associate attorney did not submit any statement on behalf of the trustee. The settlement conference was conducted by a retired judge sitting as a temporary judge. It went badly. The trustee's attorney had a ridiculous reason for not submitting the required MSC statement. And at the MSC, attorney Moore persistently yelled at and interrupted other participants. He accused opposing counsel of lying while providing no evidence to support his accusations. He refused to engage in settlement discussions, and he effectively prevented the settlement officer from invoking the aid and authority of the supervising judge by asserting this would unlawfully divulge settlement information. To make matters worse, Moore later acknowledged that his contemptuous behavior was the result of a tactical decision he had made in advance of the MSC to act in such a manner. Well, after 15 minutes, the settlement judge determined that Moore was not participating in good faith and would not participate in good faith in the MSC and ended the MSC. And Moore, the associate lawyer, and the, the uh, trustee left the MSC together laughing their heads off. The probate court proceeded to set its own OSC to hold Moore in contempt for his conduct in the MSC. The written OSC prepared by the wife's attorney recited four different violations, but as drafted, it wasn't clear exactly how many counts of contempt were alleged against Moore. The probate court found uh, attorney Moore guilty of four categories of contempt, fined Moore $900 on each count, a total of $3,600. The court also ordered that uh, Bryna's attorney fees and costs be paid by Moore. Moore promptly filed, filed a petition for writ review of the contempt judgment. The court held this was an indirect contempt because it was not conducted in the presence of the court. The uh, court before whom the contempt proceeding was brought was the probate judge, not the settlement judge before whom Moore acted contemptuously. The court held the contempt was properly brought, but there were some defects in the OSC because the OSC had held that three of the four counts, uh, yelling and interrupting, falsely accusing opposing counsel of lying without explanation and refusing to engage in settlement discussions, adequately pleaded facts that would constitute contempt, but they weren't set forth so as to give more notice that these were separate alleged contempts. They'd have to be treated as one count of contempt. And the OSC didn't give Moore notice of the fourth violation for which Moore was convicted at all, so that fourth count had to be dismissed. 
Accordingly, the court had to reduce the conviction to a single count with a single $900 fine. The order that Moore pay the wife's attorney's fees also had to be reversed because the Court of Appeals said that CCP 1218A, which authorizes the award of attorney fees and contempts, doesn't apply if the contempt is for something other than the violation of a court order. But the court expressly ordered that, quote, upon finality of this opinion, we also direct the clerk of this court to provide a copy of this opinion to the state bar. Maybe Moore will get his just desserts another way. Uh, Jim. Okay. Uh, the next case we're dealing with is the U.S. Supreme Court case called Roman Catholic Archdiocese of San Juan versus Feliciano. So in 1979, the Archdiocese created a trust, uh, the purpose of which was to provide for a pension plan for employees of the Catholic schools. That trust was terminated and the employees consequently filed suit. This resulted in a judgment in the Puerto Rico uh, court, uh, resulting in the requirement that the uh, Dutch diocese make the payments to the trust. While the appeal uh, in, if I can use state court, because I'm not sure what uh, Puerto Rico's status is, uh, um, while that was uh, pending, the archdiocese then filed in the U.S. District Court and thereafter filed a Chapter 11. The simple point here being, once notice of removal is filed, the state court loses all jurisdiction in the case. Since its jurisdiction is lost, its orders are not simply erroneous, they are absolutely void at least while the case is pending in the federal court system. This is true even if the district court later dismisses the case. In such case, if there is a dismissal, the matter is returned to the state court, but the orders that were made in the interim are not reinstated the no novo. Back to Keith, we'll get to you again, Bob, soon. Someday. The next case is Levine versus uh, Berschneider, parentheses, Richards, close parentheses, at page 49. And this is another case involving an attorney behaving badly. Uh, attorney John Richards represented tenants in uh, civil litigation against their landlord, who was represented by attorney Harry Safarian. The case settled and a judgment was entered in April 2019. In May 2019, Richards filed an ex parte application to shorten time on a motion to enforce the settlement. Four days before the scheduled hearing on Richards' application, Richards received checks from Safarian in full payment of the settlement. Richards still appeared at the hearing, and Safarian did not appear at the hearing. Richards told the court that he had not heard from Safarian and did not tell the court that he, Richards, had actually received full payment from Safarian. So the trial court granted Richard's motion and ordered Safarian to pay monetary sanctions of $4,630 to Richard's. Well, three days later, Safarian files his own ex parte application seeking relief from the trial court's order and the issuance of an OSC rate contempt against Richard's on the basis that Richard's had presented false information to the court. Well, Richard's argues he had not misled the trial court because the trial court hadn't asked Richards whether he had received payment of the settlement funds. Richard also claimed the court had no jurisdiction over him because there was no statutory basis for ordering sanctions against Richards. The trial court, of course, ordered sanctions against Safarian vacated and issued an OSC rate contempt against Richards for his lack of candor with the trial court. At the contempt hearing, the trial court found Richards in contempt for his lack of candor, and ordered Richards to pay sanctions of $5,310. The court also found that it had personal jurisdiction over Richards because Richards' written opposition to the contempt OSC constituted a general appearance. The trial court also concluded it had subject matter jurisdiction because appellant's lack of candor at that uh, 
first Ju June 7th hearing was both contemptuous and conduct in bad faith within the meaning of CCP section 128.5 and section 1209. Richards appealed from the contempt in the sanctions order, but the Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal from the contempt orders and affirmed the sanctions order. Contempt orders, of course, cannot be appealed. The only way to get relief from a contempt conviction is by taking an extraordinary writ. On the sanctions issue, the court held that a trial court has no duty to inquire about whether the material facts in the case have changed. It is the duty of the attorney to advise the court of material changes in facts or circumstances. Richard had a duty of candor to advise the trial court that the settlement had been paid in full, and he breached that duty. The uh, court also held that the trial court had jurisdiction of the, over the subject matter pursuant to CCP 128.5 to order sanctions against Richards. And finally, the Court of Appeal directed the clerk to forward a copy of its opinion to the state bar. Bob? Sass versus Cohen is found at page 51 of your materials. One can recite the holding in this California Supreme Court case in one line. It's the anti-penultimate one in the opinion, quote, a plaintiff alleging an accounting action must plead a specific dollar amount to support a default judgment awarding monetary relief. The rest of this very lengthy opinion is like your school math class. Uh, it's not enough to show the result, but you must show your work. This case is a Marvin action, and along with some specific dollar supported claims, Plaintiff asked for an accounting of the property purchased and income earned by the defendant during the relationship. Defendant defaults and the trial court awards damages on some of the specific uh, dollar amounts that were pled, but also on the claim where no dollar amount was pled, but where values were proved up at the hearing. Facing a multi-million dollar judgment, the defendant figures this could be a good time to respond and moves to set aside the judgment. Now we all know CCP 580 says in a default, the relief granted can't exceed the amount demanded in the complaint. But the plaintiff says one files an accounting precisely because you don't know the proper amount, but the defendant does. Reviewing precedent, other relevant statutes, dictionary definitions, and common sense, that is defendants don't necessarily know the value of assets in question, such as an estate or a business. The Supreme Court reverses that portion of the trial court order that awards damages on the accounting portion of the default judgment. Along the way, the court notes some family law cases that hold when the petitioner files using standard forms, it's sufficient to advise the defendant, quote defendant, that's the court's name for the respondent, not mine, uh, of the type of relief requested, not the specific dollar amounts. The Supremes don't, don't validate this. They don't say that's okay, but they assume that it's correct because of the differences between a family law action and an accounting action, emphasizing again that a Marvin action is a civil action. But note, there's a little daylight here on the issue of non-specific dollar demands so if you're on the bad end of a default action, you could try to exploit this. It's probably a loser, but you never know. Uh, Jim. I think we're uh, Keith Brewster. Oh, Keith, sorry. So the next case is Brewster versus Clevenger at page 52. So Chris and Mary Kay Clevenger separated after 21 years of marriage. Chris put $10,000 a month into an account for Mary Kay to use for temporary support. Chris eventually files an RFO to set spousal support, seeking to classify the $10,000 monthly deposits as spousal support. And this happens long enough ago, he says, and it's income to her deductible to me. Um, and Chris also asks that the court uh, deny spousal support to Mary Kay in the future because Mary Kay had been convicted of criminal domestic violence. Family Code Section 4325 creates a rebuttable presumption against awarding spousal support to a spouse who's been convicted of criminal domestic violence within five years prior to the filing of a dissolution of marriage action. Mary Case admitted she was convicted of some criminal counts, 
turns out what she was convicted of was stalking, which was not literally violent. Mary Kay also testified to three events in which Chris allegedly committed domestic violence against Mary Kay. Well, the trial court rules that Mary Kay had not rebutted the presumption of Section 4325 against an award of uh, support to a spouse convicted of domestic violence. The court ruled that the $10,000 per month deposited by Chris for Mary Kay's use was indeed temporary spousal support because the court believed that the parties had actually agreed to this. And the court held that Mary Kay will not be awarded uh, spousal support going forward. Mary Kay appealed, but the Court of Appeal reversed only a very small part of the trial court's judgment and otherwise affirmed the judgment. Family Code Section 4325 can be rebutted by, quote, documented evidence that the convicted spouse was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of the other spouse. In this case, Mary Kay only testified uh, to incidents of domestic violence allegedly perpetrated against her by Chris. That oral, oral testimony is not documented evidence. Documented evidence means writings as defined in Evidence Code 250. Writings include far more than actual writings, of course. Voicemail, cell phone recordings, 911 calls would uh, fall into evidence that could be used to rebut the presumption. But Mary Kay had none of that. Further, the court held that domestic violence doesn't have to be physically violent and stalking falls within the ambit of domestic violence. Therefore, the trial court was correct to find that Mary Kay had not uh, rebutted the Section 4325 presumption against awarding her spousal support. The trial court's characterization of the $10,000 per month uh, deposited by Chris as temporary support was affirmed, but you should know that the IRS is not bound by the trial court's characterization of it as tax deductible by Chris and reportable and includable by Mary Kay. This case also holds that when the parties stipulate to the value of a particular asset, it's reversible error for the court to award that asset at some different value. Bob? Nicole G. versus Warren Braithwaite is at page 54 of your materials. Warren and Nicole live together in a house purchased by Nicole but now held in joint tenancy with Warren. Each of them filed a DVRO application against the other, and there was also a civil partition action regarding the property. Around the time she filed her DVRO, Nicole moved out of the house. The factual claims in the case aren't important to us, but it's enough to know the court grants Nicole's restraining order and denies Warren's. As part of the order, Nicole is given possession of the property and Warren is ordered to move out. Now, Family Code 6321 does provide that the court uh, granting an art restraining order can exclude one of the restrained parties from the common dwelling of the parties. There's a limitation, three items. Uh, first, the party who stays must have a right under color of title to the property. Second, the court must find an assault or threat to assault. And third, that if uh, no exclusion is granted, physical or emotional harm would result. On appeal, Warren raises three primary issues. First, he said the trial court didn't make these three findings specifically on the record. The Court of Appeal uh, does uh, address this, citing some general findings, but notes the substantial evidence test applies there was substantial evidence supporting the ruling, no matter how the trial court phrased it. The evidence itself meets the requirements, whether the words used by the trial court do or do not. Next, Warren says Nicole moved out. She wasn't living there when she filed. The Court of Appeal says the fact that she moved out to avoid further abuse is not an issue. Finally, he says, this should be decided in the civil partition action. Court of Appeal essentially ignores this. They state they have no opinion about that action, but until it concludes, Nicole has temporary use of the property. This is unquestionably the right outcome. Warren appears to be a pig, but I wish the opinion had been more direct on the legal holdings. Jim. Our next case is Smith and Accord 
Uh, the two of them were engaged, but they never married. Perhaps because McCord went to Las Vegas without Smith. We've all heard the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Perhaps McCord should have stayed in Vegas. Anyway, on his return, many arguments ensued and Smith had it with him. McCord couldn't take no for an answer. He called her many times, blew her phone up with texts, tried to talk to her, hugged her against her will, pinned her to a bed and held his, her his hand over her mouth. McCord denied all of this, never touched her. The trial court did not believe McCord. So restraining orders can uh, result from conduct that disturbs the peace of the other party. Prior cases have held that disturbing the peace can occur where mental or emotional calm is disturbed. Here, McCord's conduct amounted to an effort to exercise dominion and control over Smith, enough to disturb her peace. The fact that it did not amount to profanity, shouting, or threats is not relevant to this standard. What's interesting is that uh, they amended 6320 subdivision B, uh, the definition of disturbing the peace now includes coercive conduct. And basically uh, all domestic violence, I shouldn't say all, but most domestic violence is really the result of an attempt to uh, coerce and control the other party. Uh, Keith? Okay, the next case is Curcio versus Pell. Uh, that is at page 57. Uh, Jennifer Curcio and Julia Pels had a six month dating relationship that ended in early 2016. Uh, Curcio and Pels were both comedic performers. In late 2018, Curcio filed a request for a uh, Domestic Violence Protection Act restraining order against Pels, claiming Pels reached out to people at the theater where Curcio performed in an attempt to have Curcio banned by falsely accusing Curcio of physical and sexual assault. Curcio stated that when she was not banned from, from the theater, that Pels had publicly posted Curcio's name uh, and those accusations on social media, and that the me post on media urged people not to book Curcio on comedy shows. Curcio uh, sought a stay-away order, orders borrowing Pels from posting anything about Curcio, and the right to record any communications by Pels. Uh, Curcio and Pels appeared at the uh, DVPA uh, hearing in Pro Per. The judge explained that because a TRO ex obtained ex parte without notice, apparently, created a presumption that some type of abuse had occurred, and I quote the judge, it's a rebuttable presumption, which means that respondent Pels may overcome and dissolve the presumption through her evidence. Well, Pels testifies that Curcio had no evidentiary support for any of her accusations and that Pels posting told the truth about Curcio's verbal, psychological, and mental abuse of Pels during the relationship. And the court said, well, because Pels, you haven't filed a, uh, your own petition for a DVPA restraining order. This is all irrelevant. And Curcio said, look, this uh, posting on social media was having a detrimental effect on my career. And the trial court ruled that telling venues not to book Curcio qualified as an abuse in violation of the DVPA. Pels says, wait a minute, I didn't do that. My, and my postings were on my private Facebook page. That's a Facebook page that only people that I actually allow to see it can actually see it. Court didn't care. The court issued a two-year restraining order uh, against Pels, and when Pels politely and respectfully objected, the court decided that Pels, by objecting, had failed to accept responsibility for her own conduct and extended the restraining order for an extra year. Well, Pels appeals, the Court of Appeal reverses. First, the court held that private Facebook posting of Pels was insufficient to support the issuance of a domestic violence restraining order. The court held that a single private Facebook post 
is utterly different from the kinds of posts and texts that other and other conduct that were found sufficient in other cases to support a DVPA restraining order. This is the first published case putting a limit on what conduct would support a DV restraining order based on Nat Carney's holding that disturbing the peace of a party entitles the disturbed party to a DV restraining order. The court then held that the remaining allegations do not support the issuance of the restraining order because the trial court had improperly shifted the burden of proof to Pell's. The issuance of a TRO does not satisfy a prima facie basis for a DVPA restraining order at the actual DVPA hearing. And it was reversible error for the trial court to have told uh, respondent Pell's that it's Pell's burden to prove that her uh, Curcio's allegations made in the TRO were not true. And finally, the Court of Appeal found that the trial court's extension of the duration of the restraining order against Pell's by a year because the court didn't like Pell's polite, respectful objections was an abuse of discretion. The trial court gave no legal justification for such an extension, and this is an additional uh, reversal by the trial court. Uh, Bob? In Remarriage of Everard is at page 58 of your materials. After a hearing, the trial court issues a reciprocal domestic violence order against both husband and wife. The underlying factual findings recited in the opinion are of lesser importance to us as the appeal was primarily based on procedural issues. Citing Family Code Section 6305, husband claims the trial court ruling lacked the required findings. That section prohibits mutual restraining orders unless the following requirements are met. One, both parties have to file separate requests on the mandatory court forms. A request and a responsive document won't do. Second, both must personally appear. And third, the court must make, quote, detailed findings, close quote, that each acted as a primary aggressor and not primarily in self-defense. The trial court did not set forth findings specifically labeled under each heading. Uh, that set, uh, the, set forth factual details that supported the findings. Rather, the trial court made the findings of ultimate facts. Both acted as primary aggressors at different times and neither acted primarily in self-defense and then more generally reviewed the evidence it found credible. Is that a, quote, detailed finding, close quote? The Court of Appeals says that while there is not much authority interpreting this phrase, there has to be factual findings sufficient for an appellate court to assess the basis for the court's decision. Here there were, so the order is upheld. Once again, it's the facts set forth rather than how the findings are phrased that's crucial. There's also a fair amount of discussion of the importance of the protection of the DV statutes um, for uh, victims and the role of the court in guiding victims through the process. Uh, those might be helpful if you're dealing with a reluctant judge, but I do cringe a little bit uh, with the a priori implication that the moving party is in fact a victim before the finding is made. Jim. Our next case is JM versus WT, and it involves a domestic violence case. Here the uh, hearing date was set for January 29. Five days prior, petitioner asked the court uh, to continue the hearing because petitioner was scheduled for spinal surgery on January 28, the day before the hearing. The trial court showed no compassion and not only dismissed petitioner's restraining order, but did so with prejudice. So now we look at family code section 245 subdivision B, which provides that either party may request the continuance of the hearing, which the court shall grant on a showing of good cause. The request itself can be made in writing before or at the hearing or even orally at the hearing. The trial court did not state any reasons 
except that it should have been heard in Department 2C by ex parte application. Petitioner here showed good cause. Uh, that is spinal surgery. I, I frankly doubt that he was voluntarily going in or she was voluntarily going in for spinal surgery to get a continuance. The request here should have been granted. The uh, next case is Jennifer K versus Shane K at page 61. Uh, Jennifer K. and Shane K. had a dating relationship. They broke up, but they had sex a week later. And whether that was consensual or rape, the result was a daughter born in 2009. Jennifer did not report the rape, if it was that, to the authorities. Jennifer and Shane had an off-and-on relationship thereafter. In 2017, Jennifer filed a request for a DVPA restraining order. And her request included incidents such as in 2011, Jennifer and Shane had had an argument and Shane raised a fist to Jennifer, but he turned and he punched the refrigerator at the level of Jennifer's head rather than Jennifer. And he left a dent in the refrigerator. This put Jennifer in great fear of Shane. Uh, Shane's response is to say, I did hit the refrigerator but it was after she had just hit me uh, hard in the chest. And I had deliberately turned away from her to do what I did. And he was sorry. Jennifer also alleged that Shane had physically prevented Jennifer from entering the house during a child custody exchange and slammed Jennifer's body into a door frame. And Shane had a different explanation. Um, the hearing before the court consumed six afternoons and a involved testimony from 18 witnesses plus the parties. The trial court ruled that, uh, oh, Jennifer testified to numerous other incidents and so did Shane. Needless to say, they were in total conflict. Um, the trial court ruled that Shane and his witnesses were more credible about the particular alleged incidents than were Jennifer and her witnesses. The court ruled the punching of the refrigerator was not an act of domestic violence. The court was unpersuaded by the highly conflicted evidence that Shane had raped Jennifer. It said that the uh, post-alleged rape conduct of the parties was of two parents co-parenting and not conduct consistent with there having been a rape. The court was unpersuaded that Shane had slammed Jennifer into a door frame when Jennifer tried to enter Shane's house one day. And the court therefore dissolved the TRO against Shane and denied Jennifer's request for findings of domestic violence and for restraining orders against Shane. Jennifer appealed, but the Court of Appeal affirmed. The court rejected Jennifer's claim that uh, Shane's conduct put Jennifer in fear, particularly the punching of the refrigerator, or that that was domestic violence, even though the DVPA defines domestic violence as including placing the victim in fear. The court found that adjudicating DVPA claims involves credibility determinations and found there was plenty of evidence at the trial court level to support the trial court's ruling. Jennifer also claimed that the trial court's comments regarding the way that rape victims would be expected to behave showed gender bias by the male judge. The Court of Appeal rejected that claim and noted that the particular comments by the trial judge were made in the context of a legal argument over the admissibility of evidence and did not generate, uh, I'm sorry, did not demonstrate gender bias. Bob? Uh, in Remarriage of Ancola is found at page 62 of your materials. Uh, this one dissolution case generated three separate appeals. First issue was a DV granted during the course of the case. Wife said husband was effectively stalking her by moving into the apartment building where she lived and refusing to stop contacting her. Husband says, I thought she'd already moved out, but the trial court thought he was lying. On appeal, he says, I never hit her and what I did didn't destroy her emotional calm. Easy one for the court of appeal, physical violence isn't the standard, Trial court found stalking and the evidence supported 
repeated unwanted contact. All that falls under the statute. So uh, ruling sustained. Second issue, wife had filed and lost a previous DV application and was ordered to pay $10,000 in attorney's fees to husband for this losing effort. She didn't pay and husband files an RFO rate contempt, but the contempt is heard after she wins the next DV application. And the trial court states it's highly likely to award her fees at the next hearing, so the contempt gets continued. When the two matters are called, the trial court suggests that the parties meet and confer, and wouldn't it be nice if that produced a wash on the attorney's fees? Husband makes a rookie mistake. He doesn't listen when the trial court makes a strong suggestion. And friends, forget all of the other rulings in this case. That should be your takeaway. Play, pay close attention when a trial court makes, quote, suggestions, close quote. Because when the parties don't agree, the court not only awards wife $10,000 in fees, it vacates the prior award of fees to husband. Of course, the Court of Appeal reverses. The trial court can reconsider a ruling on its own motion, Le Francois versus Goal, but it has to do so on the basis that the prior ruling was wrong based on the evidence at the prior hearing. Here, the trial court acted based on subsequent facts, and that's more like granting a new trial, so reversed. The third issue was the denial of husband's request for a finding of nullity. Husband says that the trial court used a clear and convincing evidentiary standard, but it should have been preponderance. Clear and convincing should be the standard where particularly important individual rights are at stake, and the Court of Appeals cites a line of cases that hold nullity is one of those areas. The higher standard applies, and substantial evidence supports the trial court's finding. Jim. Our next case is Yost. Here, the mother got a restraining order against the grandparents after the grandmother threatened to take the one-year-old child. The order included a no-contact provision with the grandchild against both grandparents. Now we have, three years later, the grandfather seeks to modify the order of visitation time. The request was denied. Well, CCP 527.6 provides in subdivision J, subdivision one, that the order for five years may be terminated or modified by further order of the court. Even so, it still uh, is in the wide discretion of the court. But then the court looks at CCP 533, which sets forth three factors for modification change of the facts, change of the law, or the ends of justice. But then they note that 527.6 does not in indicate that 533 is a limitation on the ability to modify. 533 does not act to limit a trial court's discretion to modify or terminate. Now, frankly, I don't understand this, but that's what the Court of Appeals says, at least as far as 527.6 is concerned. Nonetheless, the bottom line still is that the trial court has great flexibility in exercising its discretion, but so long as it is done consistently with the reasons in granting the original order. Thus, the trial court must consider whether the grandfather still represents a threat to abduct the child. Keith? The next case is uh, Menezes versus McDaniel at page 64. Uh, Natasha Menezes and Tim McDaniel married in 2004 and separated in 2013. Uh, one disputed property issue was a house in Brazil which Tim claimed as his separate property. Because Tim had problems buying the house because he was not a Brazilian, title was taken in Natasha's name. The trial court found that the Brazilian house was purchased with Tim's separate property and with the intention that it be Tim's separate property and awarded it to Tim as his sole and separate property. 
Natasha was ordered to transfer title of the Brazilian house to Tim. Well, Natasha didn't do that. In fact, there were several rounds of court orders that uh, Natasha executed all documents needed to transfer title to Tim, but Natasha didn't comply with the orders. Eventually, however, she finally delivered the necessary transfer documents to Tim's attorney. But it turns out when Tim's Brazilian lawyer tried to get the tra title transferred to Tim, the lawyer discovered that Natasha's mother had agreed to transfer the house to Natasha's Brazilian lawyer to satisfy Natasha's fees obligations, an obligation approved by a Brazilian court. Well, Tim's Brazilian lawyer filed a motion to stay enforcement of the lien in favor of Natasha's Brazilian lawyer. Tim filed a motion in the California family law case for sanctions under Family Code 271, including his U.S. attorney fees, his Brazilian attorney fees, 110% of the value of the Brazilian house, property taxes, translation fees, and catch this, $18,000 for the costs of transportation so that Tim could attend a court hearing in Brazil, and $9,000 for Tim's lost vacation time. The total listed expenses, including estimated future attorney expenses, were $189,000 plus 110% of the value of the Brazilian house. Tim showed that Natasha could afford the requested sanctions, in part by offsetting spousal support. The California trial court found that Natasha not credible, that Natasha had deliberately hidden information in addition to not complying with the court's orders to uh, produced and delivered documents to Tim, disbelieved Natasha's excuses for her delays, and awarded Tim $200,000 in Family Code Section 271 sanctions. Natasha appealed, and the Court of Appeal reversed and remanded the case to the trial court. The Court of Appeal held that anticipated future expenses related to attorney fees and costs could be included in a Family Code Section 271 award. A party need not wait until the end of a case to seek Family Code Section 271 sanctions. However, the court held that a Family Code 271 sanction must be tethered to attorney fees and costs, citing uh, Saganowski versus Kikoa from 2016, that's a Court of Appeal decision, for the proposition that Family Code Section 271 sanctions are limited to attorney fees and costs. The court here does not see Tim's transportation costs or Tim's lost vacation time as compensable or reimbursable as part of Section 271 sanctions. The order is reversed. The case is remanded to the trial court to make sure sanctions are adequately tethered to attorney fees and costs. Jim? I think it's me. Uh, okay. Yeah. Wes? Uh, uh, first of all, there was a question about a case that I cited about uh, the reconsideration on a court's own motion. That's Le Francois versus Goel. You can find it cited in the case that I mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. West, Westrich versus Higa. This is an unpublished opinion regarding attorney's fees in an anti slap proceeding. It is not in your book. We mention it only because the self represented party, who was an attorney, was sanctioned for citing an unpublished opinion in both opening and reply briefs. So just don't do it. Don't ever cite an unpublished opinion, even this one. Jim. Uh, you can cite the concept though. In Taylor versus County of Los Angeles, the claimant is an attorney, Michael Trailer. So you got Taylor who is the plaintiff's, Trailer with an R is the attorney. And for one month, he represented the family of a police shooting in the wrongful death action. And in support of his request for fees, he provided a couple of conflicting invoices, alleging either 130 hours or 180 hours of legal research and investigation during that one month's time. He then demanded $308,000 for his work. The trial court awarded him $17,325. Even the appellate court found seven different discrepancies. As such, they acknowledged the trial court 
did its best to estimate a reasonable award. The unexplained discrepancies would have entitled the trial court to completely reject all of Attorney Trail's, uh, Trailer's uh, testimony. The court points out it is not necessary for an attorney to supply a fact finder with a breakdown to support their fee request, but it's absent can be a consideration for the trial court. The attorney can provide oral evidence. It is still rele relevant, but nevertheless, it's of poor quality. The appellate court uh, reminds us, quote, wise lawyers keep accurate time records. Contemporaneous records are a pain in the, excuse me, contemporary re records are a pain to keep. But in the appellate court's points uh, out that clocks and timekeeping software make it very easy to keep accurate, extremely accurate records. That's good advice to follow. Keith? The next case is In Re uh, Leonetti, uh, page 67. Tina Leonetti hired a family law attorney in 2011 to represent her in a very contentious dissolution of marriage action against her husband, Mr. Leonetti. Tina told the family law attorney she had little money and many debts, uh, including uh, debts to her prior family law lawyer. But Tina told the attorney that her former husband owed her $150,000 in unpaid child and spousal support and other obligations and he had a 401k account. And during the same meeting, the attorney presented Tina with a retainer agreement, which uh, included the complete language of former California Rules of Professional Conduct, Rule 3-300, which is now a Rule of Professional Conduct, Rule 1.8.1, uh, including, quote, the client is advised in writing that the client may seek the advice of an independent lawyer of the client's choice and is given a reasonable opportunity to seek that advice and additional assurance that the client did not have to sign the retainer agreement or sign anything. Tina, however, did not leave the attorney's offices or seek to obtain independent legal advice before she signed the attorney's retainer agreement. Tina paid a $10,000 retainer fee by using credit cards. The retainer agreement gave the attorney a charging lien on any recovery in the DISO case. By 2014, Tina owed $150,000 to the attorney. In early 2014, the family law court awarded Tina Mr. Leonetti's entire 401k account worth $272,000. Well, it might be time to pay, but Tina did not pay the attorney at all. She instead immediately filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Tina claimed the fees owed to the attorney were a dischargeable debt. The attorney filed an adversary proceeding in Tina's bankruptcy case, uh, claiming that the fees owed to the attorney were non-dischargeable pursuant to 11 U.S.C. 523-A2A, and that the attorney's charging lien was enforceable against the recovery from Tina's husband, that the attorney had obtained only after years of legal persistence. The bankruptcy court found that the charging lien included in the retainer agreement was void because the attorney had failed to comply with that uh, former uh, rule of professional conduct 3-300 by not giving Tina a reasonable opportunity to be advised by independent counsel before she signed the agreement. It gets worse for the attorney. Not only does he not get $150,000 he's owed, Tina then files a motion in the bankruptcy court seeking an attorney fee award from the attorney based on 11 U.S.C. 523-AD, which authorizes such fees against the party who files without substantial justification an adversarial complaint for non-dischargeability in a bankruptcy case. The bankruptcy court denied Tina's motion for fees finding that the attorney had substantial justification for filing its non-dischargeability claim. It held that the attorney's factual allegations, that Tina allowed the attorney to work for years knowing the fee would never be paid in the end, and created a false and mis misleading set of circumstances 
that induced the uh, creditor attorney to extend credit to the debtor, Tina. Tina appeals and the Ninth Circuit Bankruptcy Appellate Panel reversed. The panel held that the attorney had not met its burden of showing that it was substantially justified in bringing the non-dischargeability claim. The attorney was required to show that its claim had a reasonably objective basis in law and fact by offering facts beyond the fact that the attorney did the work but hadn't been paid. The attorney failed to submit any evidence that Tina did not intend to pay her fees when she signed that retainer agreement. The attorney had presented no evidence to support a conclusion that it justifiably relied on Tina's representations. The lessons for the family law lawyers in this case are many. Here are three. One, make sure you comply with the requirements that you give clients a reasonable opportunity to consult independent counsel before getting the client to agree to a charging lien. Two, make sure you can prove that you gave the client that opportunity. Three, before you file an adversarial claim in a bankruptcy challenging the dischargeability of your claim for attorney fees, be sure you are able to provide evidence of a reasonable factual basis for filing such a claim. Bob? Uh, Chang's uh, Metro Group uh, versus Peng Zhufeng uh, is at page 68 of your materials. And from the case name, you can guess this is not a family law case. And you might wonder even more why we include it when I note it involves an anti-slap motion. But though the anti-slap issues are important, the central holding in the case is about CCP 128.5 sanctions. And we've been seeing more discussion of these in the family law listserv as the sanctions can be enforced on counsel, not just on the party. In reviewing the statute, the Court of Appeal finds there are irreconcilable provisions within it. Subsections A and C compared to subsection F. F says to get sanctions, you have to file a separate motion. And uh, if the challenge document is a motion, a complaint, a response, a pleading, you have to give the 21 day safe harbor period to allow the other side to withdraw the document. A and C say that you can ask for the sanctions in moving or responding papers. And F says you can get this sanction only after the court makes a sub A order. But as the Court of Appeal notes, that makes the safe harbor provision meaningless. The boat is already out in the ocean. After reviewing and rejecting various workarounds, the Court of Appeal finally says the legislature just had some irreconcilable pro provisions, but it wants the use of the safe harbor to be expansive. And when it's not possible or practical uh, because of timing or other issues, only then can you use the ANC procedures without giving the safe harbor. That applies to anti-slap. Not sure where it applies in family law. So if you have to, you'll have to evaluate your set of facts on this issue. And our last case is uh, Lowry versus Kindred Healthcare at page 69 of your materials. In this civil medical malpractice case, a summary judgment was granted after the trial court struck the declaration of plaintiff's expert on causation. The defense expert was a neurologist with 30 years of experience who stated uh, no act of the defendant caused the stroke suffered by the 92 year old patient. He explained why she suffered it he explained why the clot busting TPA treatment that wasn't given wouldn't work for her and why no delay made a difference. The plaintiff's expert wasn't a neurologist, but was an expert in rehabilitation. His conclusionary declaration disagreed with the cause claimed by the defendant, but gave no causation of it on, an, on his own. He said TPA would help and delay made things worse, but just said that generally. Sargon Enterprises versus USC is the California case that gives the trial court a gatekeeping function. The Court of Appeal in affirming said the trial court properly applied Sargon. Contrasting the two declarations, the court notes the defense explained the facts that supported its conclusions, but plaintiff, plaintiff's expert just gave conclusions. Further, although the plaintiff expert was highly qualified in his field, 
rehabilitation after a stroke, it was the wrong field to show expertise in the origin and treatment of the stroke. We have a lot of expert declarations in family law. Don't just give up. Make sure that they really apply, have a basis, and are in the right field. Keith. We have come to the end of our program, and as many of you know, those who hang out for the entire program reap the ben benefit of the benediction, which it is my honor for the 30th straight year to pronounce. May you and each of you collect 100% of all your receivables. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, your honors, for your presentation this evening. Excellent as always.